Good evening to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to listen to what I have studied here for a few minutes. I've been given the topic of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, First Thess- well, the Thessalonians uh, are books written by persecuted, by a persecuted apostle, a persecuted evangelist, to a persecuted church, yet is such a positive message. Um, and that is, I'll go ahead and give away the end. That's, pr- that's most of what I took from it. Uh, but I'll kind of show you how I got there. Uh, to give you some background, 1 Thessalonians gives itself a lot of context, but we will read a little bit of, uh, out of Acts chapter 17 uh, to give a little bit of backstory. Paul and Silas preached the gospel in Thessalonica. In Acts 17, 1 through 4, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So here we see the beginning of the Thessalonian church. It was born and quickly began enduring persecution. In verses 6 and 7, When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers uh, before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So the Gentiles start to uh, skew the message that's being spoken and accusing the Christians of usurping governmental authority by calling Jesus King. And persecution starts after that. Paul and Silas end up having to flee due to this persecution. In verse 10 it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So I find it funny. They're running from this situation where they just established a church. And now there's an uprising and everybody's mad. And they're in danger and they run to the next city. And they go right into that synagogue. And it just speaks to their character, I think, that they were about a mission. Um, And while, obviously, they were somewhat concerned for their safety so that they could keep that uh, message spreading, the message of the gospel was still their priority. Now, after some time, Paul sends Timothy to check on his friends in Thessalonica. In the third chapter, verse 2, it says, We sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. After receiving word back from Timothy, Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians. So let's start in chapter 1. Paul applauds the church for being a shining light to surrounding cities. Paul, uh, Silvanus, or uh, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. In verse 6, And you have become imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And it goes on to list these cities and say that who knows how many people you have touched uh, with, with your example. Paul's proud of their work in turning away from their past idols. In verses 8 and 9 it says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So this gives us a little bit of context as to uh, the types of people that, that we're reading about here. These are people who probably came from polytheistic backgrounds, serving uh, different gods, serving idols, and they have now had to put all of that away to serve the one true God that has been preached to them by Paul and Silas. In chapter 2, we learn about the relationships built. Paul describes the deep love he and Silas shared with the Thessalonians. Verses 8 and 9. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. 
Paul goes on in this chapter to encourage them to do the same thing, to be hard workers, to keep their hands busy in the work of the Lord, to not rely on anybody else, not be a burden to the people around them, but instead to work hard to be able to be a blessing to the people around them, both their brothers and sisters and the community around them. Paul remembers the persecution that they endured. He says, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So this may uh, hint to us that there may have been some people going around at this time that were taking advantage of people for their money. Maybe there were people going around even preaching in the name of Christ for money, going about it for the wrong reasons, not truly with the heart of bringing souls to Christ, but for personal gain. And Paul reminds them, that's not what we came for. In fact, we worked hard to make sure we weren't a burden on any of you because we had one mission, and that was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, Paul talks about their faith, and this to me is when I see uh, the book take a turn. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul is mostly uh, kind of, he's recapping and he's praising them for what they've done. In chapter 3, he talks a little bit about their faith and moving forward starts to give them some admonishment and encouragement. Verses 6 to 10, But now Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about, about you through your faith. For now we live. If you are standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see your face, see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So apparently this really, really pains Paul to write these, this letter. It pains him to not be able to see his friends face to face because he spent so much time and energy investing into them, teaching them the word of God and, and building this church from from the ground up. And now while it's awesome for him to hear this news and see that they are doing great and they have kept the faith, it's bothering him that he still can't see them in person because of the persecution happening. In chapter 4, Paul contrasts the new pure way of living for, for Christ with the sinful lust of the world says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. These people are living in an evil world where relationships have become corrupt And what proper sexual relationship means has has become warped. And Paul is teaching them something that may be new to them, being Gentiles, saying, God has a way. He goes on to explain the marriage, the sanctity of marriage that God has given us. And not to defile that, not to take that lightly. Paul praises them for living with much brotherly love. Verses 9 and 10, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, do this more and more. And he's just driving home the point that, yes, you know the truth. Yes, you guys are doing great, but don't forget to love your fellow man. Don't forget to love your brothers and sisters. Keep that going because as this church is enduring persecution together, the only way that they're going to get through that is if they do that together. And in chapter 5, Paul encourages the Thessalonians to keep moving forward. 
He says, let us be sober, sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Paul ends this book in a prayer. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. and May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that is how Paul closes this first letter. Now in verse 27, the intention is for this letter to be read to all the brothers. And here we are reading it together today. And I think that there are still some things that we can learn from it. So I want to talk about a couple takeaways. And I won't take more than a couple minutes. But I think the first thing that we can take from this is to endure persecution well. Not only did Paul and Silas do this, but a church of brand new Christians did this. They were described as having such hospitality for their fellow man, having love for their fellow man. And this was known in and outside of the church. Even though the world would try to pit anything against them that they could, accuse them of anything that they could to persecute the church, Truly, people knew that the church loved the people around them. I think we can learn to love people. I think we can learn to give of ourselves. Again, he talks about that hospitality. He talks about how they should work hard, not just to build up wealth for themselves, but to be able to bless people around them, to give to the poor, to help the needy. And I would challenge us. We live in literally one of the most prosperous countries to ever exist in the history of ever. And all of us here by general world standards are rich. And we say it a lot, we should use what we have to glorify God, but I want you to really, really, really think about that. Are we using the things that we have to glorify God? We're, if we're lucky enough to have transportation, are we willing to give up some time to help a brother who doesn't? If we're blessed with a home, are we willing to help that person who needs a place to stay? If we're blessed with finances, are we willing to give not just to the church, but charitably to people in need? All of those sorts of things have to be done wisely, but we're commanded to do them. We're commanded to be charitable charitable people. And then give of yourself I think means more than just uh, possessions and finances as well. Paul in chapter 2 verse 8 says, we didn't just give of the gospel, but of our very selves. They were willing to spend the time and the energy and the emotional energy and everything it takes to build those relationships with people. And when they first showed up, maybe relationships that were very one-sided, with people who didn't know about Christ and didn't know why they were showing up in their synagogues, but they were willing to put in that time and put in that effort to build relationships with people to the point where later these people are writing them back, these people are sending Timothy back with good news, and there's a true friendship that is built. Be willing to put your time in, not just here at the service, but outside of the service, Talk to your brothers and sisters, meet with them, go grab coffee or whatever it takes because we as a church, I don't think we endure persecution, at least not anywhere near to the point that the Thessalonians did, but I can't guarantee that we never will. And regardless of persecution, we will endure things in life and we need to build those relationships. We need to be able to give of ourselves. Paul stressed the importance of remaining pure. We talk a lot about how when we come to church, we're just a bunch of broken people who need Jesus. And while I get the sentiment, we shouldn't stay broken. We talk about how we're just a bunch of sinners who are are in need of a Savior. That's true, but we don't have to stay sinners. 
We can't walk around with those labels on our back forever. I think it's important that the church really does become known as being different. We talk about it a lot, but I think in our efforts to be relatable, in our efforts to obviously not be prideful or puffed up, we do forget that we really, really do have to be different. And purity, not just in the context that Paul spoke, but in all aspects of life, is extremely, extremely important. And then I think the last thing that I took from reading this is how important it is to check in on your fellow Christians. Because Paul invested all of this time into the Thessalonians, and he could have easily left and prayed about them silently and never checked on them again. And maybe some, some of you have those experiences where you've, you've really, really tried to help someone You've tried to invest a lot of time and then they move away or you move or whatever happens, you become disconnected. I think it's very, very, very important that we learn the art of the follow-up to connect with people, to stay in touch, to make sure people know that we care. Because Paul talked about how much of an encouragement it was for him to hear of the good things they were doing and I guarantee you it was an encouragement for them to hear from Paul again. And in reading these letters, sometimes we, we're, it's like we're reading one side of a text message because we don't necessarily get to hear all of the responses, but we can at least see the, love, the overflowing love that Paul had for these people they had back. I'd like to read Matthew 5, verses 13 to 14 with you guys. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So we'll pause there. I've heard a lot of people debate about what this means, what being the salt of the earth means, and what the metaphor means. Salt is a preservative. Salt tastes good, this and that. Regardless, we are something different in the world. We are a different flavor being added to the world. Christians have got to be different. And it goes on in verse 14 to say, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. It doesn't say don't hide your light. It says if we are being a city set on a hill, our light cannot be hidden. And that's the church I want to be. That's the individual I want to be. Paul not only heard good things about the church at Thessalonica from Timothy, but he was hearing it from surrounding congregations, from other connections, because the type of people that they were, the type of love that they had for the people around them, everybody knew that. And that spread. That agape love is really, really, really powerful, guys. And that, that will spread. Our light cannot be hidden if we're a city set on a hill. That's my study of uh, First Thessalonians. I did forget to mention this was in Paul's second missionary journey to kind of put this in a, a timeline for you guys. But we're looking at Gentiles coming from that background to in a very short amount of time becoming a total powerhouse for Jesus Christ. So if you have been in the church for a day or a week or 10 years, do not think that you haven't had enough time to make a good impact or to do something good. If you're not involved, if you think that there's more that you can do, talk to somebody. I guarantee you there's stuff that can be done. We need people. We need people on the team. We need to all participate in that brotherly love. We are all here for each other. Check in on your fellow Christians this week, and that's my encouragement to you. If there's anything that the church can do for you tonight, we have an invitation song. Please come forward while we stand and sing.